Thank you for inviting me and thank you for listening to me in English. I appreciate that. Uh, so what I thought I would do is to uh, try to present some of the scientific information related to uh, the production of uh, uh, fur, animals for fur production, uh, and uh, to comment on how things have changed and uh, what is going on at the moment in, in Finland and in uh, and in other parts of the world. But first of all, uh, I'll just say, if, since obviously there are ethical issues being considered, as well as scientific ones, i just introduce a few of the questions. So one kind of question is, should we kill animals for food? And on the whole, in the world, most people would say yes, but a few people would say no. And then, if we kill animals for food, and it's obviously very likely that that will continue into the future, uh, should we use the skin or the fur of these animals, uh, for example, sheep or rabbits? And I think, again, most people would say, well, normally the uh, extra use, uh, that is using the skin and the fur, as well as the, the meat or milk or other animal products, doesn't seem to have generally adverse consequences. So. There isn't any negative aspect of using it. Uh, so that's, that is a, that's one kind of question. Here, another kind of question is, we keep animals for other purposes. Uh, for example, we keep animals as pets. If you keep animals as pets, should we use their skin or fur? So rabbits or cats or dogs kept as pets, should you use the skin or the fur? And uh, you, again, the direct consequence of using that, of doing that, uh, it probably doesn't have anything negative. The action itself of using, after the animal is dead, using the skin doesn't have any negative consequence. But there could be indirect consequences. Maybe people would start stealing pets so that they could sell them for their skins, and this happens in some countries. And maybe it would change attitudes to pets, or, but it would, uh, would reduce the need for <coughs> fur farming if you could use all of that fur, which is at the moment wasted. Uh, but in general, people are not very much in favor of doing this. People don't really like the idea of using the fur of animals which are kept as pets. And then we have the general question of should we kill animals for their fur in order to make products like clothing or footwear? And you could ask that question in relation to different kinds of people. So one kind of person is someone who lives in a place where they don't have any other source of warm clothing. So is it acceptable for somebody to use, to kill animals for their fur in a place where it's very difficult to get other sources of warm clothing? Or there are people who do have other clothes available, but they don't have very much money. Um, should it be allowed then? Or there are people who uh, don't have very many possibilities for uh, having a business or a job except uh, to produce animals for the fur, which can then be sold. Then there are people who have other income, who live in a, in, in a city maybe, but they enjoy hunting and trapping. Is it acceptable for those people to catch animals for their, for, and to, for their fur and, and to sell the fur? And then is it acceptable for people who have a high income and who want to wear fur because it's a luxury and uh, they are... Uh, they, they like to do it for aesthetic reasons or because it shows that they are rich people. So there are ethical questions for each of those people. And I think in the audience there will be different answers to that question. People will draw lines in different places. Some people will say everything is acceptable, some will say nothing, and others will draw a line after A or after C in the list. Then we have the question, if animals are killed for their fur, we have the question which is, applies to all animals which we use. Uh, we have obligations towards those animals. When we are keeping an animal, or if you are catching an animal in the wild and, and, and killing it, you have obligations towards them. And I think most of us would feel we have some obligations. So if it is a farmed animal, we should ensure that their welfare is good. And most people would say, yes, you should do that. Uh, there would be some variation in how good they think it should be. So. What that means is there should be a system which fulfills the needs of the animals when they are being uh, housed and during the management procedures. And then when they are killing, 
it should be a humane method of killing. These are quite general views that most people have about farmed animals. And then if it's a wild animal which is being killed for fur, then there are other questions like preserving the population, conservation issues, as well as the welfare questions of how they are handled and how they are killed, whether it is humane killing. Well, I mentioned humane killing. What does that mean? It means killing them in such a way that there is, that there is no period of poor welfare or only a very brief period and low severity of poor welfare. So if you kill an animal by uh, putting it in a non-aversive gas so that it dies and it doesn't know that it's in the gas, then that is certainly a humane method. Uh, if you inject an animal and it dies without there being any pain, then that is certainly a humane method. If you shoot an animal and the animal dies within a few seconds, then that is not quite as good, but it's, most people would say, yes, that's a humane method. So we have humane methods of killing. We also, of course, have methods of stunning animals before they are killed, which means that it's a humane method of killing. So this concept of humane killing, then, there is, there is a threshold we would say, yes, this is humane, and all the rest is not humane. So there isn't a degree of humaneness. It's either humane or it is not humane. So we, when we talk about humane killing, we mean uh, uh, that it is above this threshold. So I'm talking about welfare of animals. So what is welfare? Well, the welfare of an individual is its state as regards its attempts to cope with its environment, uh, which I wrote in a paper in 1986. So it's a characteristic of the animal. Welfare is not something we give the animal. It is a characteristic, and you can assess the state of the animal. It will vary. For it may be very good, or it may be very bad. And you can measure it. You can assess how good the welfare of an animal is. So welfare concerns, the English word is, how well does it fare? How well does it go through life? Or how well is it? How well... It is the animal. And coping with the environment means having control of mental and bodily stability. We are obviously also con we are concerned with health, and health is referring to systems for combating pathogens. So health is the state of an individual as regards its attempts to cope with pathology. So that is a, a, an important aspect of welfare. Healthfare, health <coughs> If the animal is diseased, the welfare is always worse than if it is not diseased. But there is variation in how bad the effect of a disease is. So looking at health is an essential part of evaluating welfare. But welfare is a wider concept than health, because health refers to coping with pathology. Welfare refers to coping with everything in life. So when coping is successful, and there, there are few problems, then welfare is good. But good welfare is also identifiable directly because it's associated with different behavior, different physiology, feelings of pleasure or contentment. And poor welfare is very often associated with bad feelings, pain, fear, or other bad feelings. So the feelings that an individual have, has are, in it, are a key part of, of its welfare. But there's a, a definition of, uh, of feeling there, but feelings are also biological mechanisms. So pain is an important biological mechanism. Fear, pleasure, anxiety, these are important biological mechanisms. And so pain then is a sensation and a feeling which are aversive and which indicate actual or potential tissue damage. So I'm deliberately putting a definition of all these terms so that you can uh, understand what I mean when I use them. Uh, and uh, we, it's clear that welfare is to do with pain, but not just pain. It's to do with health, but not just health. Uh, it's, there's a very wide variety of biological systems for trying to cope with the world in which we live and in which the animals we are using live. And the welfare is uh, how well the animal is coping or the extent to which it is failing to cope. And if it is... So, these are mechanisms then, the feelings which, it, they ha which the animals have. So, 
what I've just said. So here, welfare includes health, good and bad feelings, other aspects of coping with the world. And almost all of these systems for coping with the world involve the brain. So understanding how the brain functions is of key importance. And we have also the idea of whether the kind of animal is sentient or not. So sentience involves evaluating the actions of others, remembering your own actions and the consequences, and being able to have feelings, have awareness, do things like assess risk. And so some animals we, call, we say are sentient, and other animals uh, we would say, well, they don't have that level of ability. So we draw a line somewhere and say these are sentient and these are not sentient. The concept of welfare refers to all animals, not to plants, not to inanimate objects. But we actually say we want to protect some animals and we are less concerned about protecting others. And in order to, uh, the other thing, work term which I've mentioned is needs. We should try to fulfill the needs of the animal. So a need is something to do with the biological functioning of the animal. The animal it has systems with the brain, the bodily systems operating to try to obtain resources or to respond to what is happening in their environment. And so we need to, to fulfill the needs of, of, of animals and whenever there is a set of recommendations from the Council of Europe or uh, reports from the European Union scientific committees then the first thing which is usually done is to try to list the needs of the animal, to look for the scientific publications which give information about what are the needs of this species of animal. So we do that at the beginning and then you are able to say well is the, are the needs fulfilled by this system or that system or if you use this procedure or that procedure. And that is then based on scientific evidence. So if we are trying to assess the welfare of animals we can assess what the animals need by looking at what they do when they are in, a good, in good conditions looking at how important resources are to the animals and looking at indicators of good or poor welfare if they are in a particular condition. So if they are deprived of a resource then what are the consequences for the welfare? And in order to do that there is a, there is a methodology for using for example preference tests to find out what's important for an animal or operant tests where the animal has to work to get a resource how hard will the animal work in order to get this kind of flooring, this kind of material which you think might be an enrichment material for the animal, or how hard will they work to avoid this experience. Maybe the experience is contact with humans, or contact with a predator, or uh, low temperature or high temperature. Uh, how hard will they work to avoid it? So we can look at, we can use this methodology which was developed initially in uh, psychology departments to evaluate how hard animals will work in order to obtain resources and avoid negative things. So some of these are choice tests and some of them are not. And what, is, what has happened is that the, the, the uh, animal welfare scientists are now are using the methodology of people who are <coughs> economists. We use terms like resource. The, what are the resources for an animal? How much demand does the animal have for resources? What price will the animal pay for a resource? Uh, the animal has a certain income in terms of the amount of energy that it has or the amount of time that it has. So that's, that's income and you, can, you need to know that in order to interpret uh, what it does and how, how much it will work to, to, to get a resource or to avoid something. And we have concepts like elasticity of demand and consumer surplus, which are measures we can use about how important things are. So you can plot, just as an economist plots a demand curve, uh, animal welfare scientists can plot what price the animal will pay. If you have a certain price, what is the demand that the animal has? And you can look at elasticity of demand, which is the slope, and you can look at consumer surplus, which is the area under the curve shown when you plot a demand curve. And using this kind of methodology, we have quite pre precise methods of finding out how important things are to animals and you then have a better chance of providing something for that kind of animal. So here is a mink in a typical mink cage, and we are then considering what do these animals need. It goes back to the biological functioning. Uh, 
and so let me say a little bit about that. So we know that mink are, uh, have a partly aquatic lifestyle, wild mink. They have partially webbed feet, they're fast swimmers, they can dive. Animals swim quite a lot when they have the opportunity. They do a lot of things in water. Uh, much of their food is derived from aquatic sources. So are they provided with water uh, in, in uh, fur farms? And the answer is they're mostly provided with drinking water. Um, then you can say, well, what, what do, what, how hard will the animals work for water? Well, we know that they will use swimming water, whether or not they've had experience with it. And when mink were trained to perform an action, an operant, in order to get to resources like an extra nest, various objects, a raised platform, tunnels, an empty cage, a water pool to swim in, then the swimming water was given very high priority by the mink. So this kind of information has been obtained from mink. It's also been obtained in studies of pigs, cattle, chickens, other kinds of animals. And in general, when you find that the animals give a very high priority to a resource, you try to provide that in the conditions in which the animals live. Mink, clearly, uh, avoidance of disease is very important in mink. And in general, on farms, mink disease is controlled quite well. Mink need for certain kinds of food. Generally speaking, the food which is provided is quite good. And I'm referring to mink here, but it's essentially the same story for, for foxes. Uh, but you can get abnormal behavior, which indicates poor welfare in cage mink. So you can see self-mutilation in mink. So if the environment is not very good for the animals, you may see these behavioral indications of poor welfare. So mink will mutilate, mutilate themselves. The, usually the tail is the thing which is mutilated, but other parts can be. Uh, and they will show stereotypy, so repeated sequences of movement with no obvious function, which, is now, which are now very widely accepted as being important indicators of poor welfare in animals. They're certainly indicators of poor welfare in humans. If you see somebody who is showing a stereotypy, you have no doubt that they have serious problems. Uh, Self-mutilation occurs in mink. It's difficult to get information about how much, but it still occurs uh, in, 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 on mink farms, and it's something which clearly needs to be measured if we're trying to evaluate the welfare of the animals. Uh, stereotypies, the common ones in mink, are head weaving, sequences involving jumping, root tracing, twirling around in circles, and there have been a whole range of different studies of this, uh, of stereotypies in mink, and also of stereotypies in foxes. I'll just give some examples for the mink. Uh, in, in some cases, it's very high, a very high incidence. You can have animals which are showing this be abnormal behavior for a, a high proportion of waking time, which means that the environment for that individual is very poor indeed. So sometimes this can happen, but not all individuals are showing that. So some individuals are not showing stereotypies. So these are abnormal behaviors then which give an indication of the magnitude of poor welfare. And we know some of the factors which affect stereotypies. Uh, in the wild, in good zoos, in rich cage environments, mink do not show stereotypies. It's when they are in a, an inadequate environment that they do. If you put them in a normal cage, you get quite a lot of stereotypy. If you double the size of the cage and do nothing else, it doesn't change much. If you put in a platform and if there is a nest box, then you have a little less than if you don't have that. So how much there is for the animal to do in the cage is clearly a key issue. And it's something which sometimes stops when humans are present. Mink, generally speaking, are attentive to humans who come and look at them. And they will very often stop the abnormal behavior when a human is present. So if you want to know how much they do this behavior, you have to video them when you are not there. And if you put mink in enriched cages, then you reduce the extent of these uh, abnormal behaviors. And this very recent study done by Meager and Mason in Canada uh, was a comparison of mink in normal, rather barren cages, compared with mink which were in a cage which had access via a tunnel to a double width additional cage with running water in a trough, a shelf, and rubber toys which were changed each month. And what they found was that the mink in the normal cages showed 
quite a lot of reaction to stimuli. In other words, their, uh, the inadequacy of the normal cage was particularly due to boredom, it's to attack, particularly because they just didn't have enough stimulation, they didn't have enough to do. Because if the animals had an enriched environment, they showed less reaction to new stimuli. So the significance of this is that it's evidence for boredom in the normal cages. It, the animals are not apathetic and depressed, or there's no evidence for them being apathetic and depressed from this study. So a number of the things I've said about mink are also relevant to foxes. And here is a fox in, in, in a the normal kind of cage, farm cage. Uh, and what are the problems for foxes then? Well, one of the big problems is they are generally very fearful of humans and they are generally very fearful of other foxes. And a lot of the difficulties are because they are in a situation where they can't get away from those two things. Can we breed the foxes so that they are not disturbed by the... By, they are not fearful? And the answer is you can change them significantly. However, this work which has been going on, the work that was started by uh, Beliaev and uh, followed by Klaus Nina in Russia and followed up in, in Finland by Mikko Hari and, uh, and his uh, research group in Kuopio, uh, has shown that breeding can have a useful effect. However, the current farm populations are not changed very much genetically, I think, following on from that work. So the information doesn't seem to have been used very much. Um, and what are, what are the consequences of being fearful? Well, one consequence is that they may, the, the animals may fail to breed or you get excessive cub mortality. Sometimes that occurs because of infanticide. So the, the, the females are killing their own cubs. And this occurs especially in silver foxes. And this is something which is extremely rare in other kinds of farmed animals. We don't generally see infanticide in other farmed animals. There have been in the past cases in pigs, but it's, dis it's bred out and largely disappeared from the pig population now. Can you reduce the fear of humans? And the answer is you can. You can spend time and the animals, individual animals can be made more tame uh, so they're less fearful of humans. And that is worked by, by Vivi Pedersen and collaborators in Denmark. Uh, so it, this can be done, but it takes time. And on the whole, farmers are not able to or willing to give enough time to, to, to do this. So the, most of the animals are still uh, fearful of humans in, in fox farms. And also, another indicator of poor welfare in foxes is stereotypies. And stereotypies are uh, widespread on fox farms. So we still have this problem that there are a lot of stereotypies in farmed foxes as with farmed mink. There is a, there is a, a current uh, EU-funded project called Welfare, uh, and the idea of this is to work out what will be good welfare outcome indicators for animals on fur farms. That is something which can be used by someone who is a, a veterinary or other inspector checking on the farm to see how good the welfare is on this particular farm. And there is a, a paper which has come out this year by, by uh, Mononen and collaborators uh, describing some pre preliminary results on this. And so we are getting some further information, uh, but this is telling us what are, the, what are the indicators. And that's a valuable thing to be able to use. So, we have the situation where now the possibilities for walking, running, climbing and other exploratory behaviours are very limited in fox cages. Fear of other foxes is still present in the current farm cages. And some, of, some animals are rather unresponsive. This is a, a rather extreme behavioural change which occurs in fearful animals. And so fearful behaviour directly avoiding uh, humans is a major indicator of poor welfare and fear, fear of other foxes is a big problem for foxes in a typical farm because they're, they're surrounded by individuals which they would avoid if they could. On the whole, this fear behavior, fearful behaviour doesn't seem to have changed very much in, over, over, over the years. Uh, stereotypies are reduced a bit by enrichment method, measures. So we have now the use of shelves for foxes, which were not formerly in the, many of the fox farms, and the use of some materials for the animal to manipulate, like, like some, a piece of wood. Those seem to have had some beneficial effect, but the effect is relatively small. 
Then we have the handling of foxes. Now, typically young foxes are handled about five times per year. The breeding foxes, maybe 20 times. And in most cases, this, in order to do this, uh, neck tongs are used. So then you, you can't handle the foxes without using a rather harsh method of handling. That doesn't mean they're injured by the tongs. Of course, the effort is made not to, but it's, it's quite a harsh method of handling. The animals are not easy to, to deal with, and they're uh, likely to escape if you don't use these things. Disease. What is the situation about disease on fox farms? Well, you can certainly keep farm foxes, so there is very little disease. However, uh, studies which have been carried out on Finnish fur farms show that there are still, on some farms, quite a lot of animals which are diseased, which have eye disorders, which have uh, skin disorders, which have leg problems, and in, it seems that the worst farms are much worse than the best farms in this respect. But the incidence of problems is a bit, is rather high perhaps rather too high. It's difficult to know what it really is, but there clearly can be serious problems, but the best farms can avoid most of it. Now, we have information about, <coughs> we have information about um, what is going on in, this, in scientific studies of welfare of animals kept for fur production from the uh, Euro European um, committees on the subject. Uh, which firstly it was called the Scientific Veterinary Committee and now it is the EFSA Scientific Panel on Animal Health and Animal Welfare and I've been involved with these since 1990 as you heard and uh, the people who are doing this are all just there as scientists they're selected on scientific merit they're not representatives of countries or any organization and uh, efforts have been made recently to carry out risk assessments that is what is the risk of poor welfare um, there was a report in 2001 of the Scientific Committee on Animal Health and Animal Welfare, and that followed on from a report, uh, a, a set of recommendations from the Council of Europe before that. And so this is quite a long time ago. This is 11 years ago, that report. And there was some response to that here in, in, in Finland. And there are one or two things I'll mention about what was said in that report. Uh, firstly, was said the ferret, Mustela putorius, is a partly domesticated animal, but mink and foxes are only a little change from their wild ancestors. So these are <coughs> quotations from the report. So the selection which has occurred for these animals hasn't eliminated the motivation of the animals kept on fur farms to perform some behaviours, and it hasn't favoured altered responses to social stimuli. So the animals are not very different from their ancestors. And there was a whole set of recommendations <coughs> about mink and foxes and uh, various so one, one thing which was mentioned was that there should be platforms uh, for, for foxes and various studies starting with ones by Hanu Kohon and going back uh, quite a few years now have helped to understand which platforms are best for welfare so one of the changes which has occurred in Finland for foxes is that they now have platforms as well as something a piece of wood to chew but actually not very much else has changed. Uh, I, I know that they, um, the, the cage size or the number of animals you can put in a cage has been changed a little bit uh, uh, in recent years, but uh, the changes are not very great. And the frequency of the problems, there isn't, doesn't seem to be an, any evidence that the problems of fear and stereotypies in foxes have declined. As far as mink are concerned, Hardly anything has changed. We have almost exactly the same cages now that we had 20 years ago. So when the Council of Europe uh, recommendations were made, and then later when the scientific committee uh, was, uh, report was produced, we, we don't seem to have a lot of change since that time. So, what, what is, uh, so the conclusion of most animal welfare scientists who are looking at evidence about uh, welfare of these animals farm foxes, uh, mink and foxes, it's the same story for both, is that the welfare of the typical farmed fox is not very good, it's rather poor. And that is not the same, oh, thank you very much, that is not the same as what is normally uh, being said for other farmed animals. Because what has happened is that in the pig industry, in the laying hen industry in the broiler, dairy farming, beef farming industries, there is 
there have been quite a lot of farmers who have changed systems and experimented and tried to develop new methods which would mean better welfare for the animals. Uh, and the, the extent of change in fur farming has been much less than in other industries. So I would contrast the industry. And I, I work on uh, all these different kinds of animals. And so I would contrast the situation in fur farming with the situation in, say, pig farming. doesn't mean everything is perfect in pig farming, but there had been quite significant changes, some of it for, driven by legislation and some of it, uh, some of it driven by...